Very exciting times. And no, I'm not just talking about the amount of explosives that were set off last week. <laughs> I mean a little bit of the technology that's at our fingertips these days. I mean, just the fact that we can look at an order of service up on a screen behind us, it's pretty amazing. And 50 years ago, it was fairly unheard of. One of the uh, greatest things, or perhaps biggest curses of technology that we have today, is the advent of streaming video services, such as Netflix or Amazon Prime, something like that. We're now blessed or cursed, however you look at it, to have the ability to binge watch television shows. If you're unfamiliar with that, this is a marathon session of picking a TV show that runs for however many episodes and watching episode after episode after episode throughout the day. Now, I'm old enough to remember a time when if you were interested in a TV show and you wanted to watch the whole season, you had to wait a whole week until the next episode came out. There was no marathon TV when I was growing up. And so a lot of times in those TV shows, uh, it would be a week since you've seen it. Maybe you've kind of forgotten what's going on in the show. Maybe they want to remind you of something a few episodes ago. So they'd have a quick recap, a, a minute or two at the beginning of the episode, saying, this is where we've been. Okay, now we're ready to jump into this, uh, this new episode. With the advent of Netflix and Amazon, they've now programmed that if you're binge-watching TV, it'll actually skip those first two minutes. They recognize that you've watched 27 episodes in a row, and you probably... <laughs> probably don't need that review. But I think a review is probably in order for this morning. You see, during this long season of Pentecost, we're working our way through the Gospel of Matthew. That's the center of our Gospel readings for the season of Pentecost. And it's been over or about a week since we've met together, so maybe a little refresher of what's going on in Matthew is in order today. Uh, we begin with the birth narrative. Matthew tells about the birth of Christ and the wise men coming and the gifts that he gets there. And then we skip rather quickly over his childhood and jump right into his ministry. And so we have the baptism of Christ by John the Baptist in the Jordan River there. We have the dove, the spirit descending on Jesus, the voice of the Father. This is my son. And we have that episode. He's then led directly from his baptism into the wilderness. The temptation of the devil, those three temptations, you cast yourself from this cliff. The angels will catch you. They'll keep you from being hurt. And as he moves from those temptations then into his formal ministry, his preaching and teaching ministry, we see him call the first few disciples, and then he begins to teach the crowds. He goes around and delivers in Matthew 5 the famous Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. And so he's spending his time traveling around the area of Galilee, preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God, the reign of God. While he's doing all this, he's healing the sick, he's driving out demons, He's generally drawing very large crowds. As we turn to our gospel reading today, we come at this point in Jesus' ministry, and we would look at it and say, things are going pretty amazing, amazingly terrible, actually. When you look at what's going on, Jesus is drawing large crowds. People are coming to listen to him. They're hearing the word proclaimed, but it's largely ineffective in their lives. It's not changing people. They're listening, but they're not really hearing what he's saying. In fact, in Matthew eleven twenty, 20, this is the area that Jesus has been teaching around in, in Chorazin, Capernaum, kind of upper Galilee there. Matthew eleven twenty 20 says, he calls out the people of those towns saying, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Capernaum. If the things that the people of the other cities had heard and seen what you have, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. They would have changed. But as it stands, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for you. Not only are the crowds not listening to him, not repenting, even John the Baptist, who just a few chapters ago saw the Holy Spirit descend on him, heard the voice of God, even John the Baptist has sent messengers to him saying, Art, are you actually the Christ? This isn't going how we thought it would. Are you really him or are we waiting for someone else? If that weren't enough, besides just the crowds, besides John the Baptist, he's managed to tick off the religious leaders of his day to the point that they are already seeking ways to kill him. 
according to human perspectives, Jesus' ministry is not progressing the way that people thought it should. And maybe Jesus recognizes this, maybe he realizes this, so he decides to kind of change tactics a little bit, specifically to get at the crowds, to speak to the crowds in a new way. And so our gospel reading this, this evening is the first parable that we hear Jesus teach in the book of Matthew. I, I think most of us are fairly familiar with this parable. We've probably heard it quite a few times. The farmer goes out to sow his seed, and it falls on these four different kinds of ground. The path, the rocky soil, among the thorns, and good soil. Now, as you read through the parables of Jesus, often they're somewhat hard to understand, and we have to turn to commentaries, we have to go ask pastors, we have to ask someone else to explain them for us. But luckily, in this case, Jesus himself explains the parable for us. And so the seed that falls along the path is the word of God proclaimed But the people don't hear it, they don't understand it, and the devil actually comes and snatches it away from their lives before it can take root. When it falls on the the rocky soil, or the shallow soil, you might call it, it starts to grow, but it's, it's a shallow faith. It's not very strong. And so when they face persecutions because of their faith, they quickly give it up. The faith is burned out. The faith is destroyed. They return to their old ways. When it falls among the, the thorns and the brambles and the other things, the worries of this life, the, the wants of money, the pursuit of the job, whatever in this life that distracts you from God, distracts you from the Holy Spirit, those things choke out the word, of, the word and the faith in your life, and ultimately they drive your focus away from God. And then, of course, the good soil is when the, the word is proclaimed in a person's life and it takes root in their hearts. And it begins to grow, and it begins to change their lives. While the the parable mentions four types of soil or areas the seed can fall upon, really there's only two. There's only two categories, or two responses that people have when hearing the word. Either it doesn't bear fruit in that person's life, or it does. There's really no in-between. Either someone hears the word and it causes little or no change in their life, or it begins to change them, to to bring about great change in the way that they act, in the way they interact with the world, in the way they view the world. We begin to see someone that's more at peace, someone that's kinder, someone that's gentler in, in how they act, in how they talk. A person who joyfully and willingly does good works for other people, not for the recognition of I'm such a good person, but just out of the desire and the want to serve your neighbor. We see a person who provides hope, comfort, and encouragement to those in need. These are the fruits of the word of the gospel, the faith that Christ gives you, growing in your life as the Spirit changes your heart from self-centered to Christ-centered. However, while this parable and the interpretation that Jesus gives us are fairly easy to understand, I think all of us can track with that, all of us can apply that, all of us can recognize different people that maybe this is impacted in our lives. While I was preparing this week for this sermon, while I was reading through it, I just, I kept coming back to one question. Being in Kansas, being in farm country, maybe someone can answer this question for me, I'm not sure. But when you look at what the farmer is doing, as he goes out, he just kind of throws his seed wherever it would land. Who does that? I mean, really, who does that? He's stored up this seed for years. This is his income. This is his wealth. This is his sense of security in the world. And he's just going and throwing it out willy-nilly? No. Oftentimes, at least when I was young, helping my grandma in the garden, there was more time spent preparing the soil for the seed than there was actually planting the seed. I mean, you have to till it under, and you pull out all the weeds and whatever else has grown up, and then you remove all the big rocks, and then you fertilize the ground, And then maybe, finally, then you get to planting the seed. This this just doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me. It wouldn't have made sense to them. They would have heard Jesus and said, this this doesn't happen. Farmers don't do that. But this portion of Jesus' parable actually speaks to one of the central themes of Jesus' ministry. Well, he did have a core group of disciples, a core group of people that he invested time and energy in teaching and instructing. The message that he came to deliver 
the word of God, the news of the reign of God now present in him is not just for a few people that are now prepared to hear it. It's a free message. It's cast to everyone. It's given to all. All people can hear this message. And in fact, the people that Jesus gave this message to, the people that he came and proclaimed it to, were often the people that would not be seen as good soil. They were the sinners. They were the tax collectors. They were the prostitutes. And yet these are the people that Jesus is coming and declaring the word of God to. He's the people that Jesus is coming and saying, God loves you. The reign of God is here. God is here among you. He wants to do great things in your life. Just a few chapters before, as he's preaching to the crowds, he says, come to me all, all you who labor, all you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. Not, not just the religious leaders, not just these 12 that I've picked, all, everyone, everyone who wants to, come to me. He sought out sinners. He sought out those kinds of people. He sought out you and me. He seeks us out while we're still sinners, and he proclaims the word to us. He gives us faith. He gives us the Holy Spirit. And that word then takes root in our lives, in the bad soil, you might say, and still begins to grow, still begins to produce fruit. All people can receive the gift of the word of God. And that word, that gift that he gives us, is then adoption. Adoption into the family of God. Adoption to the point that we can now see God not, no, not anymore as a, a wrathful God who's looking to punish our sins, but rather a kind, a caring, compassionate God who we call Abba, uh, the Hebrew word basically for daddy. We call God daddy. We have such a relationship, a new, renewed and restored relationship with God that we come to him and say, Dad, this is what's going on. This is what is happening in my life. This is what I need. This is what I want to share with you. These are my joys. These are my faults. These are my failures. We have a renewed, restored relationship with God. As he's sown the word in our lives, we're then called blessed and humbled that we get to continue that work in the lives of ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit, but also in the lives of the others. Because while in the parable, Jesus is the sower, Jesus is the one coming and bringing the word, we can now place ourselves in that role as well. As Christians, as part of the priesthood of all believers, we now are called to go out and spread the seed of the gospel to the rest of the world. That seems a little daunting, that seems a little frightening, but one last thing that we can take from this parable, one last thing that we can teach us, is to remain patient and to remain diligent as we proclaim the word to our friends, our co-workers, our families, whoever it is. Jesus himself came to earth and spread the word and we've already seen the crowds didn't listen to him. The crowds didn't receive him. It's not on us to make people convert. It's not on us to make faith grow in their lives. So we're humbled through this parable and we're taught that Jesus, God is the one who causes faith to grow. Our job is to spread that word to the world around us. This leaves us with the humble realization also of our complete dependence on God and his work in creating and sustaining faith, not only in the world, not only in those that we preach the word to, but also in us. The role of the Spirit who creates and sustains and grows that faith in us. That being said, we do take heart from what the Lord says in our first reading this evening from the prophet Isaiah. A little bit long, but it says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven... Do not return to it without watering the earth, making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower, bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I have sent it. We continue to sow the word of God in the lives of those that we meet, trusting in the word and the promise of God that he will accomplish his purposes in the lives of those that we meet and proclaim to. So as we go about our weeks, as we endeavor to sow the word in the lives of our friends and co-workers, as we allow the Spirit to work in us to continue to grow our faith and produce the fruits of the Spirit, I pray that the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.